Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen, my name is Crash and today we're taking a look at some of the best manga that I read last year. So last video we looked at the worst, so today we're taking a bit of more of a positive note and looking at the best 15 manga. Now what I mean by read last year is manga that I finished reading last year, so any manga that I finished regardless of when I started counts and any manga that I started but didn't finish dozens. So to start the list, in number 15 we have Junji Ito's Cat Diary, Yun and Mu. And if you follow me on social media, you probably have some idea of why this manga is on this list, as this manga talks about the actual Junji Ito, as he went from not being really a cat person to starting living with his wife or fiancé and having to live with two cats. And as someone who never had a pet in his life and when started dating a veterinary and started living with her, we adopted two cats, I relate very much with Junji Ito. This is very much, uh, it's funny because it's true kind of manga. But even if you're not someone who relates exactly to the story of the manga or you're someone who doesn't really like cats, or doesn't really care about cats, I think there's still something for you, especially if you like Junji Ito, because this manga sees Junji Ito try his hand at comedic manga instead of horror, but instead of having like a complete change of techniques, he very much uses everything that he already knows from horror manga and applies that into this one. So, this disgusting horrific faces, just the stories of paranoia and monstrous beings, and descending into insanity, things that are kind of typical from Junji Ito, you know, as well as like like um, dramatic page turns and things like that, that Junji Ito uses in his horror stories to deliver some of the best horror stories in medium. He also uses in Katari, but now applied to normal day events of cat owners and cats. And it's just so absurd that it works really, really well, and it's very, very funny. And I think just for that alone, it's definitely worth the read. So in number 14, we have Art Ball Cop and Dolphin, which is the Shonen Jump manga that cancelled last year. It's by Riho Itamura, which is the mangaka by Beelzebub. And if you know me, you know that Beelzebub is actually one of my favorite uh, Shonen Jump manga overall, and actually just one of my favorite manga, especially comedy. And it's one that I really, really love because of the comedic nature of it and the comedic timing. And Arbol Cop and Dolphin is just as funny, in my opinion. I think Tabura is someone who does comedic delivery really, really well. It's probably some of the best in the business. But I think Arbol Cop and Dolphin is more than that. It's not just the comedy. And I think the plot, uh, especially towards the later half of it, when it starts getting a little bit more serious and starts getting... A little bit more action and plot focused it's really good and it could have been the best Tamuro manga so far had it been uh, let grow which sadly it didn't i think this one also saw a lot of improvement in terms of battles for Tamura because beelzebub isn't really known for having good battles most of the battles are just like one punch from from Oga and it's done uh, and this one really saw a little bit more fleshed out, uh, like some powers, some paneling that were really cool. Nothing like mind-blowing amazing, but from the order of Beelzebub to go from that to this, you can clearly see an improvement, you can clearly see that it was giving his all to make this the best manga, it is Magnum Opus, and it just pains me a lot that it failed. But I think with the ending, it, it at least is worth the read, even if it got cancelled, because this manga was still let run long enough that he could wrap most things pretty nicely. On number 13, we got new Grappler Baki, which if you don't know, that's part 2 of Baki, which I think is where the Netflix series start, and I read the first part of Baki, Grappler Baki, in the end of 2020 and I read the new Grappler Baki in the end of 2021 so I just actually finished reading about a week or two ago and it's really fun I mean part one was already really fun uh, the thing that I liked about that one was just this amazing fights with these guys that were like super super strong and it just like a lot of it is ridiculous especially with characters like Baki's dad uh, th there's really this feeling that these guys are the strongest guys around. But part one was mostly just tournaments with a little bit of story, you know, Baki's back, uh, background and things like that. Uh, but then part two just grabs everything that Baki did in part one and just expands on it 
and it starts with a bunch of prisoners from all over the world escaping and all going to Tokyo because they're looking for defeat because they never lost a fight in their lives. So we move from battles that are mostly in this one arena to battles everywhere in the streets of Tokyo uh, and it just gets a lot more imag imaginative and every character, especially like the, the villains, the prisoners, use a lot of different techniques and a lot of different like objects and things like that. We don't see very much uh, on the first half of Baki or on the first part of Baki, I mean. It is just a natural expansion of the world and we get to see these characters go out and interact with other people with, you know, just living their lives and just starting, suddenly just starting fighting everywhere, which is really fun. It, it does have a tournament at the end, uh, but I didn't like it as much as part one in that regard. I think the tournament of part one, I really like big tournaments and part two set up that and it just didn't deliver. It's still a fun arc, uh, it still has some fun fights, but I think the first half of new grappler Baki is really the one that sold me. Of course, it ends on a big note and it made sure that, I, that I'm gonna read part three earlier, not just at the end of the year. On number 12, it's Claudine. So I've recommended Claudine before on my LGBTQ recommendations video. And I've talked about it, I think, on my Year 24 video as well, because this is a Year 24 manga. And it features a lot of Year 24 tropes, so to speak. It talks about gender identity. It talks about sexuality. It's very dramatic. It's uh, set on this kind of like Victorian-esque uh, time. Not very precise when that is in the manga, but it's just kind of like this European style uh, narrative. I haven't read too much of Year 24, even though it may look like it uh, from my video, but Claudine, out of the ones that I've read, for me was my favorite. It's definitely one that is very dramatic, as is from all of these that I've read. I think this is a, a very interesting read because it's one of the first manga about a trans character and it tackles the topic in a very interesting way uh, so yeah check it out on number 11 we've got Ningen Konchuki or the book of human insects which is uh, I think my fifth or sixth Tezuka manga that I read which may sound a lot but really isn't when we are aware of like the hundreds of manga that Tezuka actually has and so far this is also my favorite it reminds me a lot of Kasane, which if you guys don't know is also one of my favorite manga uh, in the way that this story is about this woman who basically steals the personalities and uh, not really the personality but more of the persona of someone else. In Kasane is a bit more literal and a bit more supernatural in that she can take the face of someone or can swap the face of someone and can take a role. But in uh, the Book of Human Insects, it's just this woman who has the natural ability to pick up on your tics and personality and ways of, of going around and even like knowledge and, and things like that. And she just adapts her, herself to, to slowly become you and become a better version of you. So taking your place in your job, in, your, in the society and things like that. And it's very, very interesting because we get to see how she affects people. Though I gotta say, I think the most effective chapter is very much the first one, where we don't really know who this character really is or what she is about. And as the other chapters more or less serve as a way to expand on her identity and for us to finally understand what she is all about and her story. But I think the first one, this the mystery that surrounds the character really makes it. And getting into the top 10, we have a big one. It's Sukuru no Ken or Fist of the North Star. This was my big read uh, from Shonen Jump of the year. It's a classic, it, especially like in terms of battle shonen. It is very much one of those that is pinpoint as not maybe not their origin, but one of the big foundations, like the grandfather of the genre. And it was really fun to go back and see how it influenced things, especially Jojo and Berserk, and see how, how both of them took things from Okudun Ken. And it's a manga that I, for the most part, I really loved for some of the reasons why I love Baki as well. It's very manly, the fights are <laughs> they're not amazing, but they're just this filled of testosterone. But the thing that really sold me into Okudun Ken is Kenshiro. I think Kenshiro is kind of like the perfect role model character. It is very manly, but is not manly in 
a toxic way or manly in like the same way that Baki characters are manly where they're just all about raw strength. In Okuda no Ken, Kenshiro is super strong and he can beat anyone, is incredibly overpowered compared to pretty much everyone else that is fighting him for the most part. That's why he has the catchphrase of you're already dead because he kills you without you even noticing. But Kenshiro is also a lot about love and friendship and taking care of the weak and you know and protecting peace and things like that. He's not someone who goes out and fights for the sake of fighting, he's someone who goes out and fights because the nature of the world where he lives in requires him to be this kind of person so that he can make the world better. And uh, the other thing I really like is well, pretty much every other character surrounding Kenshiro. I think his friends and villains and anti-heroes that pop up every arc are really pretty cool. And the way that they relate to Kenshiro, especially the villains, the way that they have some relationship with Kenshiro, it's, it's pretty cool. I, I like when a villain and a hero have some relation, not necessarily like bloodline uh, relationship, but, you know, in terms of ideals, in terms of history and things like that, I like that there's a connection between them. And with Kenshiro and Okuro no Ken, Kenshiro pretty much has a relationship, has a, a story with every character, with every villain, I mean, before they appear. At least the main ones, not, not the kind of villains that appear to get beaten by Kenshiro just because. The thing that stops Okuro no Ken from being higher on this list, however, is how repetitive a lot of the arcs kind of are. Like I mentioned, these anti-heroes, we got like these anti-heroes kind of characters who end up being friends with Kenshiro, and we got these villains who have this relationship with Kenshiro, and we also have like the mid-boss villains, I guess. And for the most part, these characters seem to have the same beat by beat story in the arc. There's this guy who appears as a villain, but isn't really a villain, and then he befriends Kenshiro and changes his ways, as Kenshiro is getting ready to fight the big bad guy. And then at the end of the arc, after being super friends, they die. And this happens a lot. This happens pretty much every single arc. I don't know, it's just every story is more or less the same. In some regards, that's nice. In others, it kind of starts getting not really boring or tiring, but predictable, where I kind of already know where this character that just got introduced. I kind of already know where the character goes uh, because there's only like four... <laughs> different storylines for every single character that appears in, in Okuro no Ken. The other thing I don't like too much is the fact that every arc feels big. And this was a struggle that I had because I like hype arc, so I had to really try to understand why I didn't like Okuro no Ken's way of doing them. Uh, and the conclusion I came with was because there is no goal. Or rather, there is no overarching goal or no, no overarching villain to beat throughout the story that we get a slow build to. So for example, in One Piece, we get to find the One Piece. And despite some arcs having some fantastic villains that are great and have some relationship with, with Luffy and everything like that, at the end, we know that that's not the last arc because the last arc is finding the One Piece. That's the final story, the same way we... In Naruto, it isn't really that linear, but we kind of get like Madara build up as the final villain, that doesn't happen, but as the final villain of, of Shippuden, we get Orochimaru build as the final villain of the first half of, of Naruto and things like that. So we get this build up to a, to a character, to a villain, regardless of how the other villains in the story uh, are. That's something that isn't pre present in Okuro no Ken. Every arc, every time a villain appears in Okuro no Ken, I get the feeling that this is supposed to be the big bad of the of the final arc, and it never is. <laughs> There's always a bait and switch in someone's bigger uh, at the end, and they don't really, most of the times they don't really feel bigger, because the the villain of the very first arc already feels like gigantic, that there's not much that higher that it can go, the best thing we can do is build another villain that is as big as the previous, which, to be fair, does happen. But with, with the exception of one, with the exception of Raho, which is easily the best villain in the series, I think I'm not alone when in saying that. That arc, the Rao arc, feels <laughs> bigger than all the others. It's sad that it's not the last one. <laughs>
and then we got another one the final arc that really doesn't live up to the expectations uh, set up by the Raho arc and that's all I'm gonna say about Okunu Ken because I think I've dragged long enough and it's probably gonna be the biggest segment of this video jumping into number nine we got not simple this is a short story a one volume long story which the most interesting part to me is how it starts with the ending so the prologue the chapter zero is how the story technically ends we start with this girl meeting a kind of a homeless guy and giving him some help and some food and we get to learn some bits of his story and how he actually is related with uh, the girl's supposed aunt and why is he doing it in america when he's from australia and a little bit of a hint of a friend of his who's a novel writer that is trying to write his story and we get all this sense of what is happening and at the end of the chapter that character dies and then we go back and we start learning everything that led to that event and it's a very interesting story it's a, a bit on the same vein of um pun pun you know this dramatic kind of a bit of depressing slice of life um th the thing that you may not enjoy i guess of this manga is the art cell though personally i enjoy it i i've been reading some manga of with similar art styles like for example dalman salman i think that's how you s dalman salman salman that's something like that uh <laughs> the guy from voynich hotel that have a little bit of similar arcs uh art styles and i, I dig them I i've learned to dig them number eight we have Tayo Matsumoto's Go Go Monster and I've been slowly falling a little bit in love with Tayo Matsumoto over the past two years I've read four manga of his Go Go Monster is not my favorite my favorite manga that from his I've read in 2020 which was Takemitsu Samurai and Ping Pong but I think Go Go Monster uses his art style really really well the story of these kids in you know in school which one of them starts seeing weird than different things and just kind of like this almost like hallucinations of some kind and we're we need to understand if these are you know imaginary friends or anything like that if they are real and the manga really never solves that but i think that's what makes it great i think tayo Mutsumoto works best in these kind of like abstract metaphorical stories about character development because i i think even things like ping pong, which is very straightforward, it's a ping pong story. I think the best moments of that manga is when it goes a little bit outside of the box. It just uses the imagery to convey emotions and metaphors. And Gogo -Go Monster is just a lot of that. I just love this art style. I know a lot of people don't, and to be fair, three years ago I didn't. But now that I've gotten more into Tayo Matsumoto, now that I've digested his uh, work style or his art style i mean it's really good a lot of it feels like a painting in a way that no other mangaka is doing especially like takimitsu zamurai if you don't like uh tayo matsumoto's art please check out takimitsu zamurai just so you can get a feel of how he uses this weird art style to make really beautiful um pieces of of art essentially on number seven we have a manga that i've talked about very very recently um and it's the spider-man manga which is a manga that i wasn't expecting to be on this list before i read it but that it just is so good now i made a whole video about it um that i'm gonna link in the upper corner or in the description below we'll see this is a 1970s manga so it's not really that far into the spider-man mitos you know it, it's just about like 10 years um or not even 10 years after the spider-man first uh came out and it's a bit more of a darker take on it more of a more serious take on it and it slowly becomes something else it slowly becomes a, its own story with the roots on spider-man but very unique villains very unique approach to it especially in the middle of the manga we have some really great chapters about the human nature essentially as he finds himself getting with friends that aren't morally correct all the time that are more in this this gray area yeah, some 
teenagers that are just like being teenagers but in bad ways and he tries to help them and a lot of times he can't you know just not super villains like there's a complete chapter where he it's just about this guy who starts like trying to shoot people because he can and then he runs away it's all about the power that he has of having a gun and it's again it's not a super villain it's just a normal dude with a gun and it works fantastically well so yeah it's not your traditional spider-man manga or your traditional spider-man stories but it's really really good on number six i'm sorry not sorry it's a gravity boys so this enters the list by almost a technicality because the last chapter came out on the 3rd of january of 2021 and therefore i read it then and there was also a chapter uh an epilogue chapter in the middle of the year so technically it counts and if you were my friend or if you were talking with me in 2020 you probably are aware of how much i love gravity boys because i've talked about it a lot and i plan on doing a video on it just a full-on video at some point probably sooner than later in 2020 when it was just we're getting into all of this situation of the pandemic and and getting like quarantined and things like that and the world was scary we didn't know what was gonna happen having this manga which lasted for essentially from Je december of 2019 to january of 2021 having this manga just make me laugh was really really appreciative it's a manga that i really love because of the cast especially the four main characters these were a gravity boys they feel very much like genuine friends just hanging out and having in mind that the premise of the manga is pretty dark this guy just went to space to explore a uh, planet and when they were in space planet Earth explodes and they are technically the last humans alive and this manga just <laughs> doesn't care about how dark the, the premise of the story is it's very much just four friends hanging out being friends and being stupid with each other and I, there's just something so pure about it that i can't help but enjoy so so much and i'm very sorry that it ended uh but it's a gag manga it, it, 50 chapters is enough it doesn't really care about solving the main plot which is fine because i don't think it needs to solve the main plot either and the final arc is one of the best things i've ever read in manga the final arc is called the pen the penis world arc and i'm not gonna expand much on that because it's the best send-off a manga could have had having in mind the situation where it was where it got cancelled and the, the mangaka probably had like four chapters to wrap things up and he decided to just do the best thing he could and it was amazing so check it out on number five we're really starting to get into my favorites of the year and we're starting with rookies which i've also talked about i've also recommended on a previous video and rookies is a baseball manga about delinquents and it's kind of like slam dunk if every character was the main character of slam dunk every single member of the team is a hardcore delinquent and there's this a professor or this teacher who decides to help them reach their dreams of, of building a baseball team which none of them really cares about that but it's more about the story isn't necessarily about a team fighting for the finals of tournament x or the the koshiken i think it's how it's called the base the baseball tournament the baseball nationals in japan um it's not it is technically about that but it's not really about that it's about these guys finding purpose within themselves and these guys having someone who really generally cares about them and how generally caring about someone that is broken can help you know change them and it's really fantastic story really badass story as well because it's a delinquent manga i love delinquent manga that's why part of the reason why i love Belzebub. if you haven't read rookies go read rookies it's fantastic and that's something you can say about the rest of the other manga that are going to be on this list from now on. And number four, we have Kaiji. Or, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's the first part of Kaiji. Because I'm currently in the middle of the second part of Kaiji. And I've heard about Kaiji <laughs> many, many times. A lot of people had recommended me to read Kaiji. I was kind of afraid that the manga would get overhyped. 
and that I wouldn't enjoy it as much. That was definitely not the case. So Kaiji is a manga about gambling and just essentially just the main character Kaiji going through some games and finding ways to kind of overcome them and it's a bit of like a lot of people are comparing them to Squid Game, which is part of the reason why I read it, is because I wanted to do a video on Squid Game. But it's so much more intense, even if the fact that lives aren't on the line, it's just incredibly intense. I think part of it is because lives aren't always on the line, and because of that, Kaiji can lose um, a lot of the matches. And some of the stakes of this manga, even if they aren't li lives, which sometimes they are, sometimes they're fighting literally for their lives, sometimes they're metaphorically fighting for their lives, sometimes they're fighting for fingers and ears and enough money that if they, can, that if they lose, their lives are essentially over anyways. And it is just so good. I'm currently on part two, as I said, uh, and it's continuing to be really, really great, and I hope the next parts are amazing as well, because this manga, my god, is one of the most intense things I've ever read, and I love it. I love every single minute of it. Reaching top 3, we have Aru no Noroi. I think this is released as Aru's Curse in English, I'm not 100% sure. And this is a very beautiful story about a couple that is connected by the passing of a woman, which is the sister of the main character and is the wife or the fiance of the other main character, the male main character. And despite this, these two characters end up dating. And it's a bit of a story of how that affects them, how the death of, of this person affects them as well. It's kind of depressing, of course, uh, but it is really beautiful and we get to explore this main character and her relationship with her sister and how she feels about all of this because she doesn't really feel well. And you know, the, the struggles of, of grief, essentially, and I don't know, it, it is very much an amazing manga that's only two volumes long. And I recommend every single person to just go read it because I haven't read it legally, but I'm definitely going to buy the volume and I'm definitely going to reread it again because it's one of the best manga I've read this year. And for the longest time, it was the best manga I've read this year. And the, the last two uh, kind of came out out of nowhere. Well, not really out of nowhere. But number two is Sasurai Amanon. It's another manga that I've recently did a full video on it. It's the main uh, mascot of the channel if you don't know so this is a manga that i've been reading for a long long time it's the manga that i have here actually um memories of amanon then this okay so this memories of amanon this is sasurai amanon or amanon wonder and this is the first the two volumes that have been out for a long long time and recently they've translated the far the fourth and final volume of the amanon arc and the third volume of sasurai amanon uh, and it's a manga that's really, really important to me. A manga that I've been, that I've, again, I've been following for 10 years. And a manga that has my favorite character of all time. I'm gonna link the video, uh, uh, again, on the description below where I talk about how special it is for me. But it, it is just very special. The reason why it's not number one is because, for me, Memories of Amanon is the best manga. Is the best one. And Sasuke Amanon is a very nice very great exploration of the character, best memories of Amanon, but it never reaches the peaks of memories of Amanon. And also because it kind of got cancelled, there's a lot of threats that never get closed. With that said, I think the, the final volume is really beautiful, and it does close some things, which is really nice. And if I want more, I guess I can read the novels eventually, at some point, which I really want to. I really need to. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm really, really incredibly sad that this manga got cancelled, because I wanted it to continue for years and years and years. But it is what it is, and I love it as it is. Finally, on number one is a one-shot, and by saying that you probably have guessed which manga it is. It's Tatsuki Fujimoto's Look Back, and 
it's another manga that I made a full video on it and that's a video that I recommend checking out only if you have read the manga because I go into pretty much every detail and I try to kind of explain essentially what I think the manga is talking about and the themes that it's talking about. But yeah, I, the, the reason why I really love Look Back as a one-shot, which I don't really love one-shots that much, it's because it's more than half a volume long. And a lot of one-shots don't get to explore a lot of the topics that they talk about. Some of them are really, really short, some of them are nice, but they, they don't get to explore things as well as a full-fledged series or of, you know, just even a volume series. Look Back, with 120 pages, manages to fully explore everything that it wants to tell. It's the story about this mangaka, or this child wants to be a mangaka, and how willing she is to fight for it. I think it, it, uh, it's also a story about the meaning of manga and the, the influence that manga can have on, on someone. It's a manga about mental health in mangaka as well, and... It's also a tribute to the incident that happened, the fire on the Kiwani Studios, which happened in 2020, I think, or 2019, not 100% sure anymore. It is a very beautiful story, all in a single chapter. And it says Fujimoto, because if you don't know, Fujimoto is the same mangaka that wrote Chainsaw Man and that wrote um, Fire Punch, which I absolutely love. Taksuki Fujimoto is rapidly becoming one of my all-time favorite mangaka. I would already consider it number five, probably. And that's not just because of how amazing his long-form series are, but because his one-shots are also really amazing in their own rights, although a little bit different. Because his long-form series are wacky, all over the top, and just incredibly unique in the story structure whereas look back it's it is like that look back isn't super wild compared to chainsaw man if you're if you're going to look back expecting a chainsaw man i think you're going to be disappointed but it is an amazing story nonetheless and the way that he knows how to tell stories and the way that he improves the art style as well in this manga the way that he uses imagery and paneling and everything oh my god it is it, just amazing i called it masterpiece in my video and someone was like oh you're <laughs> dropping into clickbait now and i said no it's not clickbait this manga or this one shot is a masterpiece and it's by far the best one shot i've ever read and i think it's gonna be the best one shot i've ever read for a long long time and that's it i hope you enjoyed this list so let me know which manga was your favorite maybe i'll give it a check and maybe it will appear on the top 10 manga list I read in 2022 at the end of, or at the beginning of next year. And if you watch it till here, thank you very much and I'll see you next video.